And we're live. Hello, everyone. Um, glad to um, uh, see you again today for another episode of the Laptop Side Chat. It's the last episode of the series as we're getting out of lockdown and hopefully uh, resuming a normal life. Uh, but we're going to finish on a high. We have two exceptional guests today who are joining us from the New York area. We have uh, Jana Marin from Insider. Uh, your vice senior vice president of programmatic and data strategy, Jenna. Correct. That's correct. Thank you. Great to have you uh, to have you on the on the webcast. And we also have Jeremy Fain, the uh, co-founder and CEO of Cognitive. Hello, Jeremy. A little, Hello. a little fuzzy, a little fuzzy there, but we can see Am you. I? We can hear you, so it's all good. Well, that's not um, so great. Great to have you guys on on board. Um, we're you know we're waiting for a few, a few seconds for you know, people to log in, uh, but I guess we're gonna you know get started with a uh, with a bit of a, an introductory questions. Maybe maybe just uh, you know a, a quick introduction, a bit longer introduction than I than I did, uh, uh, Jana, about your your role at Insider. Can you can you tell us a bit more about what you do there? Yeah. So I work across. Uh, basically the entire organization thinking about how we can use uh, so one half is just you know programmatic I have a programmatic sales team under me um, but also data and first party data and how we can use our ability to engage with our audience in a way to help advertisers understand uh, the consumers who are engaging with them on our sites um, using various technologies. And, and your sites are Business Insider, obviously? Business Insider, insider.com, and marketsinsider.com. Okay, cool. Um, Jeremy, your, your title is co-founder and CEO. I know that well, so it means you do everything, but can you tell us a bit more about what Cognitive does as a company? Sure, Cognitive was founded five years ago now. Uh, with the idea that there's so much data available in programmatic and there's so much um, opportunity from a consumer behavior perspective that deep learning what had had the opportunity now to create a real solution from an algorithmic perspective for buyers. So what we do is we have a technology that automatically builds custom algorithms we call it adapt, adaptive algorithmic advertising. And those algorithms then go out and buy media for on behalf of our clients uh, from a performance perspective. So we're very focused on performance KPIs, uh, CPA, ROAS, uh, incremental CPA, things like that. So we're really uh, sort of the new way of doing performance advertising. It's automated, it's self-learning. Uh, deep learning is enabling all this stuff. So that's that's really what cognitive is about. <clears throat> okay, and, and so so you work with buyers. Do you work with as as a as a as a DSP effectively, or do you work with their DSP or with the stack that they're using? So cognitive was founded with the idea that actually at the same time as companies like Beeswax were coming about where we all sort of figured out that the DSP and the pipes were very commoditized. Access to inventory was commoditized. All right, so then what's, what's setting things apart uh, is really the brain of the DSP. And we had the opportunity to build a company that was just about the brain. So we started Cognitive with the idea that we're not a DSP, we're just the brain. We're the algorithm uh, for rent, or the brain for rent, uh, and then we plug those brains into the pipes. Uh, in reality, uh, all of the DSPs out there don't have the ability to plug algorithms in, especially deep learning algorithms. And so we, we effectively, uh, right now our business model is much more of a managed service, but it's not really how we were founded. That's sort of a pivot because of, uh, because of the technology limitations right now okay great thanks for that for that uh introduction i think it's interesting that we have i mean on your your both on kind of either side of the of the market trying to create intelligence using data to better sell or better buy 
what's your um is that a, is that a fair kind of summary of 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 uh, of the this, yeah not not totally agree with that uh, uh jana no you, it's you, fair you, you, okay okay um I'm, I'm i'm i guess my my question is around the 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 weight of of uh, of of data and i mean historically um a lot of data has been used on the buy side maybe less so on the sell side do you feel that that publishers are 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 getting more uh, um aware and and invest more on this on this side of things on using data to better monetize is Absolutely. this uh, yeah i mean at least you know the top premium publishers for sure uh because one thing that we saw over the last several years is an increased request for insights and data uh and to be able to use data and with the excuse me the death of the cookie it basically you know our insights our our ability to provide insights in places where a third party cookie can't be seen uh is super valuable to our, our our customers okay and and how do you how do you go about this what type of like are you working with 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 technology solutions you've you've invested in you've built technology on your side as well what's what's been your journey towards this kind of so increased we, understanding yeah, so, of data so we spent um a better part of 2018 and 2019 revamping our entire first party data strategy so that we could provide unique insights um and we started with uh basically just you know a new DMP that gives us the ability to set a first party cookie on 100% of our audience we then added on some natural language processing so that we were able to go beyond just the vertical level and get down uh to you know themes if you will um and content bundles and you know and we will continue iterating on that process we have some you know deterministic data that will help us um basically create the seed to be to build models off of like with our mortgage calculators and retirement calculators right so that way um you know when somebody says they have to be um you know with a household income of 100k plus we can actually prove that we have that audience based on the seed data and the model. Uh and so we're continuing to iterate on our first party data platform and we'll continue to do so uh because we believe it it you know it benefits everyone including the consumer. Yeah, I I I'd like to get back to that but before I want to ask you a question Jeremy because I think I mean again we've seen a lot of usage of data on the buy side and that's fueled uh, you know uh, uh, logics like the one that's beyond cognitive how do we be more uh, how can we be more intelligent do you think the pendulum is going to shift back to publishers especially with with the difficulty to access data and, or or to use cookies and 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 uh, uh, kind of individual identifiers do you think the pendulum of that kind of data driven intelligence is going to shift back to publishers uh, where 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 do you think the market is going there It's funny being on the buy side now because I've been on the sell side for a lot of my career. I know. <laughs> and uh I can see the advantage of the pendulum swinging back, but I think my my experience on the sell side has always taught me that the money talks and the buyers will demand, I believe. So I have an optimistic viewpoint from a buyer's perspective that a technology solution will be made available to buyers that will continue to offer sort of a one-to-one -one attribution capability and i believe that the buyers will use that and push that solution so i am pessimistic that the publishers um uh will i you know we're we're talking in terms of power structure and things like that i think that the money will continue to push the agenda and the money will continue to ask for uh, a one to one attribution solution. Okay, so we're we're going to go into the identity discussion because that's really what we're touching on here, right? I I I do agree with you that it's going to be difficult for buyers to invest without having the ability to address audiences that they, they might be able to do so in with with more insights from publishers and more contribution to publishers to what's really been 
I mean, if you if you look back maybe five or ten years, it's really been a one a one way discussion, right? With buyers deciding where they want to buy without much uh, 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 kind of control or ability to influence this decision from publishers, right? Especially with things like retargeting, which have had a massive impact on CPM, it's been only only buyer driven or mostly buyer driven, right? And I think we're gonna we're gonna see a a, a balance with with more insights from publishers and more participation from publishers. But I also agree on the fact that if buyers cannot have intelligent buying strategies and measurement and attribution, et cetera, et cetera, they, they will not invest, period. Right? And so it cannot be just a sell-side driven uh, uh, marketplace either. Especially since as a buyer, you have alternatives with the walled gardens who still give you, you know, with all, despite all of their flaws, a, a massive one-to-one -one addressability capability. Yeah, right? I mean, look, if you look at a macro, if you look at, a, at it from a macro perspective, all the advantage that publishers have gained over the years has been because of the one-to-one -one cookie attribution capability. All the intelligence that buyers have gathered, that have gained over the years with the digital capability of the cookie is why all the budget has moved from television and traditional media into digital. So losing that uh, may, may swing the pendulum a little bit back to publishers for a while, but I think that they will see that uh, non-digital capabilities will gain more power and the budgets overall in digital may fall back uh, to pre-cookie uh, days somewhat. So I, I, I'm, I'm interested to having your, your, your answer to that, Jenna, because one of the things that we hear, and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, horribly paraphrase here and simplify, but a lot of publishers consider that they've been screwed by by programmatic, right? And that programmatic hasn't delivered on the promise and all of the, the reports that you hear about the lack of transparency and the money going to the middleman and everything, a lot of publishers feel frustrated because they feel like programmatic hasn't delivered on its promises and they haven't been able to make create as much value as they should have because of because of the, the infrastructure and 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 uh, and uh, the intermediaries and and uh, the over reliance on on data from a buy side where do you sit on this do you think again to to take to take uh, jeremy's comment do you think programmatic has been a good thing or 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 a bad thing for publishers or it could have been better let's say well i'm the svp of programmatic so <laughs> <laughs> what do you think uh but uh i think it's a mixed bag, right? So if you think about programmatic, right, uh, just as, you know, set it and forget it, media buying, then no, it has not delivered on its promise. Uh, but if you look at programmatic as a, as a way to help people get to that one-to-one -one attribution or as a way to facilitate transactions easier, um, then yes, it has. But all of the infrastructure that we created, all of the lack of transparency, right? I mean, we're fixing it, we're cleaning it, we're, we're working very hard on it. I think, um, I don't totally disagree with Jeremy that, that, um, that we'll see a shift, you know, back to places where it's less transparent. But the reality is media buying as a whole hasn't, right, the notion of attribution for anything except digital hasn't and hasn't been one to one. And I think that that there'll be a blend, right, of one to one plus insights plus um you know, uh, cohorts plus, right? So, I mean, we're, it's, it's not that one-to-one -one is gonna go, to wet, go away and it's not that one-to-one -one is gonna be the only thing. Uh, and I, so I think that we'll find a balance as we grow up uh, as an industry. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with that. Um, so let's talk about what, what's, what's kind of underpinning this discussion, which is the ability to identify users, right? Where We've been using cookies for the past 20 years to do that. Cookies are going away. Um, some people say good riddance because there was a lot of flows around cookies, you know, in terms of like user experience and, and data leakage and all those things. But at the same time, it's difficult to rebuild the foundations without 
you know, the entire house crumbling, right? So what's your, what's your perspective on this? How are you preparing for this transition? I mean, from maybe starting with you, Jeremy, right? Your business, I assume, feeds off of data, of user level data, right? So how do you think you're going to be working in, in two to three years when this user level data is either not available anymore because you receive cohort signals or, or you know, key to something else? What's your, what's your perspective on this? Well, I, I have a perspective on a number of different levels. So part of my resume is working at the IAB. So I believe that this is an opportunity for the ANA, the 4As and the IAB to work together to develop something that works for everybody and includes choice, just like we started with the DAA years ago when I was at the IAB and we created the self-regulatory framework. Uh, getting rid of cookies will make a lot of that easier if we can come up with a, a different, uh, whether it's server side, email hashes, whatever we come up with technologically, uh, will make sort of that universal ID system much more enforceable, much more choice oriented, uh, much more traceable from a regulatory perspective. So I think this is a great opportunity for us as an industry globally uh, to use technology uh, in a better way. And frankly, um, get out of, take back control as an industry of how uh, we work with regulators and things like that, instead of being held hostage by uh, browsers that are not part of the industry, right? So, uh, you know, we, we firmly believe at Cognitive that you should give the consumer the choice uh, to have their data used for better interest-based advertising instead of giving them zero choice uh, and taking that opportunity away from them. So, you know, that's sort of the, the industry-wide view. For us at Cognitive, uh, again, we're optimistic and hopeful that uh, that kind of ID system will be put into place in the next couple of years by either an individual company like ID5 or an industry uh, coalition. Uh, but we as any hopefully good business would do, we're hedging our bets. Uh, for us, we look at buying as a uh, unified optimization problem, okay? And the old, the old uh, saying of we're trying to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time and the right place uh, has four pieces to it. We, we unify that in, in one sort of algorithmic question. Uh, but if we have to take the right person out of that piece, we will. Uh, it will make uh, analysis and learning slower. It will have to happen at a more macro level. Uh, but we at Cognitive are ready for that uh, because we've already solved all four of those pieces. If we take one away, we'll still have three uh, and we'll, we'll keep on chugging along. Okay. Thanks. That's 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 really interesting. I think one one other thing I'd like to uh, I'd like your your point of view on Jana is the 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 notion that the customer should be more involved into this value exchange a lot of that rests on the publishers like you you are the publisher has the interaction with customer right and so and 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 you could argue that we've been in an implicit value exchange for a long time by basically giving them access for for a lot of content and services for free with the implicit understanding that they would allow us to monetize their attention and their data uh, via advertising well, do you I, think so? Let's just uh, here's the thing with that, right? Is that, uh, yes, um, the I don't know that the value, ex I don't think that consumers really understand that content's not free, um, okay. and so I do think it's important that we explain that value exchange to them, um, right? Because what's happening now is people are paying for their content uh, from the various streaming channels and, you know, right? And then, you know, they're being asked to pay to, pay to subscribe or not, you know, or just subscribe, not even pay. And I don't think they understand that the way they pay for it is with advertising. Um, and, and we as an industry have done a really bad job at explaining that to our consumers 
Um, and but I do think that when we do explain it to them, they get it and and it's okay. Um, and so you know when ad blocking first became a big thing, you know anytime somebody had an ad blocker, we would say, you know please add us to your white list as, you know, ads are the way that we pay for our content. And we had a very, very high uh, rate of success by doing that. And so as an industry, we need people to understand if you like to watch the Today Show, right? The way that gets paid for is with ads. And it's the same thing when you want to read Insider or Business Insider, right? ads fund content. Uh, and that ha is, hasn't changed in hundreds of years, you know, a hundred years. But but it, it has to be more transparent now. It has to be more explicit in that value exchange, right? Because we Absolutely. require them to to agree, right? Because the new, the new regulations are going to force us as an industry to have consent to be able to use that data. And that data is what fuels the advertising, the, the value of the adver of advertising on sites. I think it's just the problem is that people don't understand the data we're talking about, right? Uh, they are thinking of data as, you know, their social security number, their voting records, right? They're not talking the about like, number, yeah. oh, Jana likes to read about marketing and advertising a lot and is specifically interested in programmatic, like, you know, um, and by the way, she's also a mom and, and, you know, lives in New York and all of these other things, right? So that's where I think we need to find a way to explain to consumers that when we're talking about data, we're not talking about me, Jana, or you, Jeremy, right? We're talking about uh, behavior, right? And if we understand your behavior, we can deliver you better content. We can deliver you better ad experience, right? We can um, help you surface more of what you're looking for. And, and that's where we lose a little bit of that uh, understanding, if you will, right? Because yeah. when people think about data, they think about data breaches, like with Equifax or Cambridge Analytica or Marriott or right. And that's all very scary versus, you know, I like to shop online. I, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And and everything is going to put into the same basket of, of, of data privacy, tracking protection, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, no one has a problem giving away their entire life to Google and Facebook. Right. And, and let them know everything about them, including, you know, their relationships and, you know, their hobbies and their personal details and all those things. And then you've got this like huge level of scrutiny on, on, you know, arguably a lot less sensitive data around behaviors on websites and content that has been consumed by users and stuff like that. I think people I actually think consumers are very wary of giving all their data to Google and Facebook, but they don't know how to take it back. Yeah, but uh, are they, are they, are they do because they're still doing it? Oh yeah. No, I mean, you know, I mean, you, can, you, can, you can get out of Facebook. To you accept. Like, yeah, exactly. No one, no one forces you to share your life on Facebook. No, they just don't. I don't think they understand. I have, I have a little bit of a different view. I think that, I think that people, I think that people actually are more aware than ever that there's data flowing around the internet, you know, especially as I talk to, just people that I meet at a dinner or, or things like that, I don't think they understand how it's used or, or what it's used for. But, you know, I look at empirically uh, what's been happening. Uh, Europe especially has had GDPR for a couple years now, and they've had this button uh, that is annoying on the bottom of every website that says you have to do this. People just click OK, right? We've not seen a significant or material dropout of people with uh, okaying the cookies and the capabilities of tracking. And I think that that is indicative of the level of the problem, which to me is, it's not really that big of a problem to consumers. I think of course they don't want their private information uh, stolen, 
Uh, but I do think that they're actually becoming more educated on what the differences between their credit card data, because that's really what they care about, and uh, social security data, and never having put that in anywhere on Facebook or things like that. Uh, you know, I think GDPR and the California data privacy, uh, all of those things have shown us over and over again that the consumer doesn't really care about cookies being used uh at all because we see no react no negative reaction to any of it yeah and 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 despite that the browsers are are have taken it as their mission that's right to protect consumer against those evil cookies yeah but that that is a business decision right i mean if you think about it apple has basically said your privacy is a luxury and if you can afford you know, a, an expensive laptop, a thousand dollar phone will protect your privacy. So that's why you should spend the money. Right. And Google has had no choice but to say, Oh yeah, yeah, we care about your privacy too. Right. But, but really you're talking, I mean, this is about, these are for profit companies who make their money. Google makes a majority of their money on advertising. Apple makes it on devices. Right. And so, um, Basically, it's, you know, you, you want to be able to, you want to, you know, you want to protect yourself. You have to have an expensive phone. Uh, yeah. And, 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 you know, we, we're going to protect your privacy on the web where we don't have an interest, but in apps where we take 30% of everything that's sold, then all of a sudden privacy is much less, much less of a concern, right? And, and you can have a mobile ad ID everywhere tracking you all day long without Apple kind of uh, um, having anything to say about this for now. For now. Uh, yeah. So let's, uh, we got a, we got a few, a few more minutes, but I'd like to, uh, I'd like to um, um, talk about this, um, you know, this new world of identification. So you, you mentioned uh, Jeremy, the, the, the work that the AB is doing around defining guidelines with project reARC. Uh, there's, there's obviously one of the, one of the solution to enable identification of users across websites is to use email addresses, which are as close as it get to a to a persistent identifier. Uh, so I guess from from a publisher standpoint, Jana, what are what has been your your strategy to kind of encourage users to register? You've had you have a subscription model, obviously, but what's the what's the? Can you tell us about the different kind of tiers of engagement, or how how you're talking to to users and how you're trying to get their how do you trying to kind of build the ability to continue to identify them without without third party cookies in the in the future? Yeah. So for us, it's it's. I mean, yes, we have a subscription service. We're collecting email addresses, um, but really, we think that it's less about the email address and more about their behaviors and actions and how deep can we get right. So if you're, you know our ability to get somebody to fill out a mortgage calculator or a retirement calculator or, right, these are really important indicators for us. Um, and as we build up our subscription service, I will say me personally, this is not an insider view. I'm very worried about the notion of an authenticated versus an unauthenticated web uh, because we know that at any given time, only approximately 25% of people log in. And those that don't want to log in and are very worried about their privacy, right? What happens to their web experience when uh, they're not authenticated? And so, you know, there's this hybrid model where, you know, <laughs> you can use the uh, authenticated to inform the unauthenticated, right? But but what really worries me is that for people who don't want to log in, where are they going to go to get their information and what sort of quality information will they receive, right? Are we proliferating fake news by having everybody log in? And then when they don't want to log in, they go searching for a site which may or may not be uh, premium in nature, where they get their news. Uh, those are just some of my personal concerns. Uh, I think the industry will figure it out, but I, 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 I worry about 
the have and the have nots of the authenticated versus the unauthenticated web. Yeah, one hundred percent on this. I think there's a real there's a real danger, and this is actually something that we've voiced at the at the IB in our in in the, in the you know as part of the reorg discussion, right? That we are going to create a a a a, a tiered web with with the, the logged in users which will bring the most value for publishers and which will have access to the best content and then the rest of the population will, will not have access to that content will not be valuable for publishers and we're going to be left out and and in terms of of not only the advertising uh, market but also this the the the, the societal impact of this uh, uh, it's it's huge and i i totally agree with this um what's your what's your point of view on this uh, uh jeremy how do you how do you look at this going forward Again, I'm a little bit more optimistic than Jana on this. On this, I, I think you know, as a buyer, we see what traffic exists on the web. Um, fringe sites are fringe in that they're small. All the big sites, I don't, I don't necessarily. This is not going to require a full login, but if we go the email hash route, uh, asking for an email and setting a first party cookie on that uh, or another new technology uh, will be the way that people will be identified for their websites. And if you look at the traffic that are the top 100 sites, the vast majority of them are very large branded sites that you've heard of, especially the top 10. So when you go to the 80-20 rule already, we've got sites that are already either asking for email logging in or doing those things. So I'm a little bit more optimistic. I agree that it is a valid uh, concern and something that we need to worry about. But if we go, if marketers, which is, you know, all, all players in the internet space uh, take a long time to adopt things and change things. So I would say if the ANA and the marketers push hard to adopt a one-to-one -one attribution capability, then you'll see the money shift very quickly to those and reward those that have uh, the email capability. And hopefully uh, uh, non-authenticated sites will either have to choose again to, to be part of this uh, choice mechanism, first of all, and, and, or, they, or they will make their way some, some way, shape, and form, which yeah. you know, we, can, we can never stop. I think it's really a, a kind of a product strategy discussion, right? From a publisher, you need to be, you need to to structure your content and the type of experience you offer to consumers, to 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 visitors, uh, in tiers, right? And depending on the level of interaction you want, if you're able to subscribe, if you want to pay money to access content, if you just want to give some data but you don't want to pay, if you don't want to give data, if you don't want to consent to anything, like you should have access to different types of things, right? Like it's like a menu at a restaurant. We can't expect right now it's like in, in Europe in particular, right? Someone goes to a site, they have access to the full content, whether they log in or not log in, whether they consent or not consent to their data being used for advertising. It's like going into a restaurant and eating the same menu and then leaving with $50 bill or $10 bill. It doesn't make a difference. You still eat the same thing. And it, it doesn't make any sense. And so it there has to be some kind of like structured value proposition uh, to encourage consumers to to uh, to uh, to engage more with with the website but at the same time we have to to accept that not everyone wants to engage not everyone wants to have a super deep relationship with every single site and so you should still be able to come and just read an article on a site that you never visit anymore um, because you're interested in a particular piece of content without having to go through like a 27 question login questionnaire and, and things like that right or else we're going to lose the diversity we're going to lose the you know the 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 what what makes what what makes the open web a a rich and a vibrant uh, a source of, of of information and entertainment? Uh, and I agree with your with your with your eighty twenty rule, but you don't want to lose the twenty either because there's a lot of value in the twenty in terms of again diversity and 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 you know uh, uh, creativity and and everything that that's important for for, well, for society as well. Without getting into the morals and ethics of, of what we want the internet to be, the reality is, and we'll be very straightforward with this, a company like Cognitive or any sort of buying platform will only buy uh, impressions that have, and uh, if this authenticated system exists, we will only buy impressions that are authenticated. 
So the reality is the money will be spent only within the authenticated areas. The people that are authenticated will make the money and take the money from the pub, from the, uh, from the marketers. And that's, I think that's as straightforward as, as it will be, you know? Yeah. I think there's again, different tiers, right? Um, you know, being able to onboard, uh, 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 customer data, right. When you're a brand, when you're, when you're Marriott, uh, we, we mentioned earlier and you want to reach your, your, your loyal customers and be able to onboard this. I mean, just c custom audience on Facebook is a multi-billion dollar business a, a year, right? So we know this is super valuable. So being able to do that is very valuable, but also be able to reach prospects that you don't know is also valuable, right? And so just being able to target email address isn't going to cover all of the use cases. And I think we need to think of identity as a, as a tiered uh, uh, service as well with some users who are logged in are valuable for certain reasons. Some users who are not logged in should still be identifiable um, um, because they have value for, for other use cases, uh, maybe different values. But I think, and at least that's, that's how we're looking at this, the, uh, the, the, the ability to identify should be, should be ubiquitous uh, because that's what enables attribution, that's what enables targeting, that's what enables frequency capping. Uh, and, and whether you have a login, a logged in users, whether you have just like soft signals to work from, whether you have other types of, of, of information to, to, to power this identification capability, everything should be, should be available um, so that we can maximize the, uh, the, the ability for that audience to be monetized. But, but let's remember that, that the email address isn't just for uh, retargeting. It's an ID system that allows us to prospect and understand whether we showed an ad to somebody and then they convert it. Right. So it's not that, that it's a unique identifier. For that. It's a unique identifier. It's not, it's no different than, exactly. A, exactly. than a, than a, than a, if, I mean, if you have, if you have a unique identifier that's persistent over time, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a, a hashed email address or a phone number, for instance, right? As long as it's persistent over time and available across, across the main, it's good. The, the additional value that the email address brings is that it's likely to be something that you have offline as well, because someone came to the store and gives you the email address so that you can send them the receipt. Uh, or, or because they're a member of your, lo your lo loyalty program. And so you've got offline information about them. And so that's what makes that email address more valuable than a, than a, let's say a random identifier. But for what you're talking about, such as measurement, attribution, frequency capping, you just need a unique code. And that unique code has the same value, whether it's backed by an email address or anything else. Agreed. And to be clear, you know, cognitive does not support one technology or another right now. We're just looking to, to, uh, to uh, the ecosystem to develop something that uh, the marketers feel confident enough in from an accuracy perspective. So how we implement that, whether it's email hash or any other technology that we can come up with, uh, we don't care. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, I like that as a conclusion. I think it's, uh, it's, it, we shouldn't care. We should just have something that we can work with at scale uh, and that enables companies like Cognitive, like Insider to do intelligent things with data and bring value to marketers so that they can invest in the, in the open web and not just on Google and Facebook to reach their, their prospects and their clients. Thank you very much. It's been a really interesting uh, discussion. Uh, we're uh, uh, almost at the end of our time. So I just want to thank you again for your participation. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you everyone who's joined uh, the webcast. Uh, you can see the replay of this webcast with the link uh, uh, that you received in the invitation in the first place. Um, it was a real pleasure to share those, uh, those uh, moments with all of you. And uh, Jeremy, Jana, I hope we can see each other in person very soon. Wouldn't that be nice? Thanks a lot, Matthew. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye.